Well, good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you to our Monday Thursday service. Tonight is a night where we recall and remember that Jesus shared that final meal with his disciples. And as I was telling my kids, I said, you've got to be quiet. This is kind of a somber service. And so I had to bribe them with ice cream. But I do want to say, before we get too serious and into the service, happy birthday to Doug Hoover. Thank you for celebrating with us tonight, Doug. We wish you the best of birthday blessings there. As we uh, move through our service tonight, there will be quite a bit of call and response, and you need to follow along in your bulletin there. And my prayer is that tonight will be a time for you to reflect on the season of Lent, the season that leads to Easter, the darkness of the night turning into the brightness of the new day. So let us now worship with one another as Betty begins our responsive call to worship. In your bulletin and on the screen. In remembrance, we gather. In remembrance, we worship. In remembrance, we feast. In remembrance, we give thanks to God. Let us pray. Lord, we remember that it was on this Passover evening, while you ate with your disciples, that you turned to them and you said, this is my body broken for you. So now as we gather to remember that event, we pray that you will take all the broken pieces of us, the broken hopes and dreams, the lost relationships, the broken promises made to others and to ourselves, the broken bodies of some of us and the broken hearts of all of us. Take all the pieces of us, even the parts we do not know are broken. Take them and make them whole again in you. Amen. Jesus spent his life teaching us the meaning of love. Through word and deed, Jesus showed us how to love God and to love one another. He fed the hungry. He healed the sick. He invited the women and the children and the tax collectors and the sinners to come to the table. He broke bread with the least and lost and shared the cup of redemption with them all. He crossed boundaries of race nationality, ethnicity, gender, and class. He challenged rigid religious authority. He scoffed at the pomposity and self-absorbed grandeur. He called out the hypocrites. He admonished the scribes and the Pharisees for their hardened hearts. He brought a simple message. Love God, love yourself, and love one another. We gather in the name of Jesus and remember the way he showed us. We gather to remember not just his death, but his life. Our first hymn of this evening is What Wondrous Love Is This? Scott and Robin will be leading us, and we are also very thankful tonight to have Josh Adams with us tonight playing the cello as he accompanies Todd with the music. Let us sing with one another. If you're using your hymnal, we are doing verses 1, 3, and 4.
Jesus goes to the cross, but we are not there yet. It is close. We can see its shadow. We can feel and imagine the cold, dark night. We know that the enemies of God are conspiring. They have had enough of him. He threatens their comfort. He threatens their way of life. He threatens their power. They will come for him First, though, we will gather. We will gather with Jesus and his closest friends. We will gather with those that called him teacher, rabbi, friend. We gather for the Passover meal to remember that God saved the people from slavery. God saved once. God saves forevermore. God saved the Israelites at Passover and revealed that it is God who reigns, not the Pharaoh. Our God saved once, God saves forevermore. Our scripture for tonight comes from the Gospel of Luke, the 22nd chapter, verses 17 through 34. Luke says, Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood. But see the one who betrays me, is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to ask one another, which one of them it could be? Who would do this? A dispute also arose among them as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. But Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in trials, and I confer on you, just as my Father has conferred on me, a kingdom, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And then Jesus said this, Simon, Simon, listen, Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat, But I have prayed for you that your own faith may not fail. And you, once you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. And he said to him, Lord, I am not ready to go with you to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the cock will not crow this or the cock will not crow this day until you have denied three times that you know me. And this is the testimony of the people of God. So I want to share with you just a brief meditation tonight. And on this Monday, Thursday, I want to go back in time a little bit to the center of Garrison Keillor's life in the fictional town of Lake Wobegon, Minnesota. You've heard of Lake Wobegon before, right? Now at Lake Wobegon, there are three institutions. Do you remember what they are? The Sidetrack Tap, the tavern, where the locals gather to swap gossip the Chatterbox Cafe, and the Lutheran Church. Churches, the Lutheran Church in particular, show up a lot in Garrison Keillor's monologues. In one story, Keillor explains that the Lutheran minister, 
Pastor David Inquist is, listen carefully, a direct descendant of the first Lutheran pastor to come to Lake Wobegon. Life Leif Inquist and his wife Anna were the first. They came from Norway long ago because of, guess what? A terrible church fight. This was the issue. This was the question. Whether we will recognize each other in heaven or will our spiritual forms not have our earthly features? They fought about it for years. Some argued, yes, of course, we'll know grandma there and she will know us. Others argued, no, we will go to a finer and better life. And if you think your face is anything God would allow in a place of perfect bliss, you should take another look. Well, people got all hot about it, and the fight became so fierce that people would gladly have avoided heaven if, they meant it had, if it meant they didn't have to talk to other Lutherans. So the Lutheran church, according to Garrison Keeler, split into the facial and non-facial factions. The Inquists got sick of it. They packed up, they left for America, and they started a new Lutheran church in Minnesota. Now that is, of course, a purely fictional story. Sort of. But it's also a true story. Because there is nothing worse than a church fight or a family feud or a civil war. People who thought you knew well make decisions, say words that are hard to understand. And that uh, saying becomes really too familiarity breeds contempt. But in our scripture for tonight... Jesus is gathered in the upper room with his disciples. Jesus is washing feet, breaking bread, drinking the cup. And he does these acts when both betrayal and love are on full display. Judas will soon give away the location of Jesus for a handful of silver coins. And Peter, as the rooster crows with the morning light, will deny knowing Jesus three times. They will argue among them who was the greatest. But in between the arguing, the dividing, the factions, Jesus chooses to be there, loving those who will betray him and deny him. Now, our painting for tonight is Vincent Van Gogh. Cafe Terrace at Night. Isn't this a beautiful painting? It's on loan to us from the Beans, who purchased it at the fine establishment known as the Stable Sale in Manchester, Missouri. (laughs) Now, when I looked at this painting for the first time, knowing it was going to be used for this evening, the relationship between the upper room and the gathering of friends for a meal at a cafe in Southern France seemed readily apparent to me. When you look at those tables, whether you're looking at the painting or on the screen, and it might be a little hard to tell, but there are 12 individuals gathered around that table. Then you see the man with the long hair standing at the head of the table. That is, I presume, Jesus And then right behind Jesus, right behind the man with the long hair and in the white robe, there is a window. And at that window, it's a little hard to see on the screen. It's easier to see in this painting. But right behind Jesus at that window is the sign of a cross marking the panes of the window. And then what else do you see? Do you see something else that reminds you of the Last Supper? There in the doorway, and it's maybe easier to see on the painting, but there in the doorway is the shadow of another figure with his back turned. And I think that's supposed to be Judas. The scene is set at night. And by the way, this actual cafe still exists today. You can go there and have a coffee, espresso, if you want. And when you look at the paintings and when you look at the screen, you'll notice that black is used for the buildings, but not for the blue sky. 
The sky instead is filled with this radiant hue of blue and yellow. So in most of Vincent van Gogh's paintings, we have correspondence to either his brother or sister that gives glimmer into why he painted the way that he did. But for this particular painting, the letters are limited, except for the fact that Vincent van Gogh told his sister the night sky can be even more alive than the day. But if I were to take on the role of an armchair psychologist with a minor in art history, perfectly unemployable, I would say that perhaps Vincent van Gogh created this painting as a reflection on his life and the sense of betrayal that he had from his faith and from his family and in from his friends. You see, Vincent van Gogh felt that he never really quite fit in. We talked about how he wanted to be a pastor like his dad, but he failed in his most de desperate attempts. He wanted to find his role in his family, but he was kicked out of the family house on Christmas Day and only really remained in contact with his brother, Theo. But through his letters, it becomes evident that even in the midst of the broken relationships and in the midst of the betrayal and distress, Vincent van Gogh loved his family and the church and God. And so I wonder if Vincent van Gogh was trying to portray in this painting how to remain in love with those you love the most in the midst of brokenness, factions, and feuds. The most significant moment of the Final Supper, at least for me, and I like to think for Vincent as well, is the fact that Jesus stays at the table knowing he will be betrayed. I mean, think about this for a moment. It's your final night on this earth. You know what is coming next. There is no way out of it. And he could have stayed uh, back with his friends, back with Lazarus or, or Mary or, or whomever. Instead, he chooses to share a meal knowing full well that he's going to be betrayed by them and that even after the foot washing, they will say, I don't know him. So maybe Jesus chooses to see his final meal with his disciples, not as an act of disillusionment, which I think I might do, but rather as an act of remembrance. When you do this, says Jesus, and he's talking about the meal and the foot washing, when, he, when you do this, you will remember. Remember, put back together. And so in a strange juxtapositional sense, the act of betrayal, the act of fighting factions, broken hearts, broken relationships, while all of that is negative, it leads to the presence of God. Every single one of us know what it's like to betray the ones we love. And in the stripping away of the illusions of what community should be, we discover that in our acts of betrayal, we are broken but whole, flawed but not abandoned. And in our brokenness, we can meet the brokenness of God. And then we are made whole. So tonight, as we remember this Monday, Thursday. Tonight, as we remember that we have betrayed at times God and one another. We can still give thanks that we are not abandoned. That we are not left alone. That we can be made whole. And we do all of this when Jesus says, Remember me. So let us now prepare to encounter and to learn and to know what it means to share in this meal. As we make our way to the communion table, we're going to sing our congregational song, One Bread, One Body.
Even as they were sharing this sacred meal together, the disciples were not of one heart. Jesus knew that he was asking much from these men, and he knew they would fail him. Judas had already agreed to betray Jesus to the religious authorities. Was he angry at some slight? Was he disappointed that Jesus would not raise an army against the Romans? Was he upset with the value of the oil that the woman wasted when she anointed Jesus? We will never know Judas' heart. But Jesus knew that he would be betrayed. And what did Jesus do with the man that would betray him? He broke bread with him. All of the disciples were deeply saddened. And they asked, I would never betray you, Lord. It's not me, is it? And on the night in which Jesus was betrayed by his friend, he took the bread, he gave thanks to God, he broke the bread and gave it to the disciples, and he said, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to God, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will, will come rise. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by Christ's blood. By your Holy Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world as we feast at this heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Let us share the bread and drink the cup. When the holy meal had been shared, the disciples began to argue over which one would be the greatest. Even here, at the end of their time together, they did not seem to understand what Jesus had been teaching them all along. He reminded them that to be great in the kingdom of God meant to serve. After Jesus' talk of betrayal, the disciples' argument, and Jesus' rebuke of them, the disciples seemed to be growing anxious. Peter proclaimed, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. And Jesus replied, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you have denied three times that you know me. 
Afterwards, Jesus led his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane. He asked them to pray for him, for he wanted to be alone. And there, Jesus prayed. He asked his friends to keep watch, but they kept falling asleep. He prayed for another way out. He prayed in anguish. He prayed as a man who could feel pain, who would be hurt by betrayal, who would be scarred by the scourge, would bleed when nails were driven into his arms and legs. He prayed as a man who knew that if he followed God's will, he would be charged, convicted, mocked, humiliated, abandoned, and nailed to a cross. Knowing all of this full well, he prayed, not my will, but yours. And then he stood up for all that he had lived for. When he got up from prayer, he came to the disciples, and he found them sleeping. Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not come to until the time of trial. Judas said to Jesus, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they came and grabbed Jesus and arrested him. Please join us in singing hymn number 569, Jesus Remember Me. We will sing it three times through. And now will you join me in prayer? Holy God, in the sacredness of this sanctuary, in the midst of the silence, in the falling darkness of the night, remind us once again why we are here. You have commanded, called us to gather, to love one another, to love God, to love you, 
to serve the other. This is what is most important. Your son, our Savior, made that journey into the Garden of Gethsemane in order to be there for us, to offer us the gifts of grace, of forgiveness, of wholeness. And so in the midst of our own brokenness and acts of betrayal, God, lead us back towards you. Let us journey to the cross, knowing that on Sunday we will come to the empty tomb. And hear us now as we say the prayer that Jesus taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. There was a brief skirmish at the arrest, but his disciples quickly scattered. Peter, who had only hours before promised to go with Jesus to prison, even death, followed from a distance. During the trial, Peter remained hidden in the shadows. First, a servant girl saw him and said, This man was also with him. Woman, I do not know him. A little later, someone else on seeing him said, You also are one of them. Man, I am not. And then about an hour later, still another kept insisting, Surely this man was with him, for he is a Galilean. I do not know what you are talking about. I do not know Jesus. At that moment, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. And then Peter remembered what Jesus had said to him. And he wept bitterly.
And now, go in peace. Amen.